So the first thousand days has been a really big subject, an important subject for very, very, very vital reasons, because the brain and the nervous system is forming and developing in response to our environment. Prenatally, the last trimester of pregnancy is really, really important. And the first 18 months or so are absolutely centrally important. The brain is in a way a bit like a muscle in the sense that it's plastic, it's pliable, and it grows with exercise. And if you don't use it, parts of it will just fade away. And so we, our brains are adaptive and we can adapt to live in any environment, any culture, any emotional culture in the whole planet. So we can live in the Arctic, we can live in the Sahara, we can live in abusive environments, rich upper class environments, poverty stricken environments. And our brain and bodies and nervous systems will adapt to that environment. But what's really vital is that in that adaptation, we're developing templates in a way, unconscious shorthands for how to be. So whatever kind of early experiences we have will change our brains, the kind of neuronal pathways will change our nervous system. So the ways in which we interpret the world unconsciously, because nearly all experiences is interpreted unconsciously. And this early learning is vital because we are so plastic and things can change so much in these early months and years. But once these patterns are in in train, as many of us know, they're harder to shift later on in life. So because these become default ways of being, default ways of acting, default ways of interpreting the world. And that's how we live and see the world and inter and experience the world. And then we act accordingly. So whoever the primary caregiver is, and it could be a mother, it could be a father, it could be somebody who's adopting a child, their role in a way is to grow and develop the nervous system and brain of the developing infant to give them a sense of themselves. So the great pediatrician and psychoanalyst Donna Winnicott said the first sense of self is a sense of self as reflected back through, he was written, writing a long time ago, so he just used, used mothers. But the first sense of self is that which is reflected back through the mother's eyes. So what you need is somebody who can see you, understand you, think about you, be aware of your emotional state. A baby doesn't know why it's upset necessarily. It doesn't even know there's such a thing as upset, but it might cry or, sh or scream or be upset at a loud noise, say, or a stranger or something like that. And the parent's job is to help make sense of that. It's what we call containment in psychotherapy. So the parent has to be able to take into themselves. I know what you're experiencing. I can feel it with you. I'm not gonna be overwhelmed by it. I can stay with it and then I can help you make sense of it by saying things, oh, that was so upsetting, what a big loud noise, but I think it's gonna be okay because that was just the washing machine going a bit faster than usual, whatever it happens to be. And so in a way you're, you're providing the tools and equipment for the baby to be able to interpret and experience the world for themselves in the end. But to start with, the parent's job is in a way to lend the infant, what we might think of lending them their prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that can help them regulate, make sense of and develop um, their own, make sense of and interpret the world because they can't do it on their own because human infant is born incredibly premature, incredibly unready to survive on its own and absolutely needs the parents. Play, if you think about what play means, play is that ability, you know, one person called play um, training for the unexpected, which I think is a wonderful um, description because we have to feel safe to be able to go with the unexpected and go with the flow. And then if I think, wow, that's such an interesting thing, whatever it is that's in front of me, and I wonder what it can do. Oh, maybe it can do that. So you need an adult around you to help you get to the next step. It's what Vygotsky called the zones of proximal development. But the exploration has to come from me. If it's coming, oh, I wonder if she's gonna tell me off for that. I might do it to please her or him, but I won't do it again. I won't keep exploring. So there's the difference between extrinsic motivation, which is I'm doing something because somebody else thinks I'm great and they're going to give me a star or a nice reward, or intrinsic motivation. I really love doing this. This is so interesting. And playing in this grass and looking at these flowers and it, okay, if a parent tells me that this flower is called a daisy or, and it's interesting, you know, if I, if it's interesting, it's aligned with my play, that's great. But actually I'll learn much more if I feel safe, if I feel interested, if I feel loved, if I love the world, if I feel excited. And there's no better way of doing these things than through play. And it's important to know as well that play doesn't just necessarily come naturally. 
You play better if you have been empathised with more and you have more understanding of other people's thoughts and feelings, other people's minds. Because, in a, for example, if I'm doing make-believe play, I have to be able to put myself in your shoes. If I'm really insecure or being very traumatised, I can't do that. So playing well depends on a whole bunch of developmental experiences that come from these early first 1,001 days, if you like. And from there, if you then feel safe, and you can understand the world, and especially if I'm playing with somebody, we're exploring together, that's, that's when the world becomes magical. And we all know the magic of play. The most important social interaction when you're young is with your caregivers. One of the things that can really complicate things as a parent is being competitive and feeling that you're not, you're not doing it well enough and other people are doing it better. And some of these parent, I dare I say, mother baby groups can, if I dare say, can be a little bit competitive. And what's really important, I think, as a parent is A, that not all the responsibility lies on the, on the mother, that there's always a partner or there always was a partner or there's always a family, wider family or a community or other people around. There's always history, intergenerational history makes a big difference in all this stuff. There's always a wider context, whether you're living in poverty or inequality, you know, massively in unequal society, all these sorts of things. There are specific things that happen, like maybe losses early on in childhood. And we have to find empathy and compassion for the parent who's really struggling to parent. And that means that if we can open, if we can keep our hearts open and not feel too guilty ourselves, then we're more likely to be able to be compassionate and kind and caring to other parents and support each other. And that is what's gonna make the biggest difference, having supportive communities around us and a supportive environment and a supportive ethos, whether, whether it's an education environment or in your local community or in your extended family or wherever, that's what's gonna make a child feel at ease and confident and safe in the world. To help a deprived child, it depends what we mean by deprivation, and certainly a traumatized child, we first of all need to give them a context in which they feel safe. So if the deprivation is economic deprivation or living in a community which is very scary and there's lots of violence, then actually our job is not just to help the child. We need to help the child, but we also need to try to work at a macro, macro social level as well to help communities and we need this as a broader set of understandings. Social workers, teachers, everybody needs to understand this. Because if I'm living in a very scary environment or I've been traumatized, I'm probably gonna be act out. I might get into violence, I might get into aggression, I might be turned off, I might not wanna learn, I might misbehave in class. All for really, really good reasons. If the world feels unsafe and dangerous, I'm not gonna trust you as a teacher. For hearing loud noise, I'm gonna jump. All of those sorts of things. So we have to make the context safe. One of the first things that happens in trauma is that we become hyper alert to danger signals. Parts of the brain like the amygdala often are firing danger signals to us completely unconsciously. And you can't learn in that context. So always the first thing is what I would call safening. Finding a way of helping a child feel safe. And actually how does safening happen? It happens through good emotional connection. So if I, if I'm helped to feel safe by an adult that I can trust, then my nervous system will calm down, I'll feel more at ease, my breathing will become deeper, um, parts of my prefrontal cortex then are ready to turn on and I might be able to learn, empathise, those sorts of things. I want to stress, using the word stress in different ways, that um, we must never ever blame a parent for what's going on. But often parents can benefit or, or from being helped to understand what might be going on. And I've used video interaction actually a lot with parents and children. And often you, don't, you certainly don't need to point out anything that you think isn't great. You just show them a video of the interaction and see the things they're doing well. And it's amazing what changes take place. But what you'll see in those things and what we see absolutely know is that babies are like barometers of the mood states of their parents. And they will pick up, you know, if the adults are smiling and making jokes, they will laugh and smile, they don't get the joke, but their nervous systems are picking things up. But also, 
they pick up danger, they pick up stress, they pick up anxiety, and they pick it up again subliminally, nervous system to nervous system, and we, we are an incredibly resonant species. So it's our job to pick things up and to respond and adapt to our environments, as we've said. So if a parent, so a parent must never feel guilty about being stressed and anxious, and my goodness, don't we all feel that a lot of the time. But if we can help parents and they can help themselves or get help to help themselves to regulate ourselves, then that in itself will help a child. I can't tell you how many times in a therapy session or parent infant work or even as a parent myself, when I've managed to stop regulate my own breathing, feel my feet on the ground a bit more solidly, and the child calms down. It's like magic. And sometimes if I'm stressed and I'm with a child and sometimes I'm stressed and I find my mind wandering to something anxious, the child starts throwing things or something. It's extraordinary, really. So I don't know how these things happen, but we do know there's communication, um, nervous system to nervous system, we know that when things are going well between a parent, they've done most of this research with mothers and babies, and they found that when things are going well and there's attunement and synchrony, their brain waves are synchronizing, their heart rate is synchronizing. And that also happens in with therapists and clients. It happens with people singing in choirs together. What we want, what we thrive on is attunement and synchrony. And that only happens when things are going well. In all systems, when there's danger and threat, things scatter. We have, we have a responsibility to try to help ourselves as adults to regulate ourselves and to be present. And that in itself has a big effect. So there's a, there, is a, there is obviously an attainment gap depending on how you define and describe attainment. And I would suggest that some of it's purely to do with privilege. So there's a big social class gap, and that might in part come from the fact that, that there's more resources in some homes than others. There's a lot of research on language. Literally the number of words spoken or heard makes a huge, huge difference. But interestingly, equally, what makes a difference is the number of positive statements as opposed to negative statements. So if I just, if you heard the same amount of words, but a lot of them were negative, like don't do that, that's dirty, that's horrible, you're being, that will not help anyone. So it's not just the number of words, it's also the way in which they're spoken. And this is not about prejudice against any particular group, social class, anything like that. What happens if I'm living in poverty and have to choose between food and fuel if I'm lucky enough to pay for either, is that I'm going to be more stressed. There's going to be more danger. So A, we have to make sure we've got the right social supports in place. And as parents, we need to encourage parents as well to learn, first of all, to help them feel safe and more safe and at ease and to be more present to their children and to read their children's communications. But actually that isn't going to happen unless they feel safe themselves. So I feel quite concerned actually post-COVID and in terms of what's happening in society at large and the economy, in terms of what the long-term effects are going to be on the kind of experiences that some kids have had over the last few years. I think that some kids have done brilliantly. They've never had so much parental attention and they're going to be thriving and their attainment, whatever we mean by that, is going to be going really fantastically well. But other kids, they've been in climates of, of domestic violence, trauma, fear, worry, anxiety, and in that climate, they just haven't had either the emotional foundation, which, or mainly the emotional foundation, actually, which will give rise to the capacity for cognitive scaffolding and growth and development. And so in order to break that gap, if you're going to call it an attainment gap, I think we've got real responsibilities as a society on all kinds of different levels, at the macro political level, at the community level, and at the social level, but we all need to be helping people and helping parents to navigate as best they can these first thousand and one days, especially. And in order to do that, they need support. And, and this support can be emotional support, but also I'm not going to relax if I can't pay the, pay the rent and I've got people knocking on my door and I've got bills to pay and all those sorts of things. So we have to be quite forgiving as well. There's an interesting bit of research, which is early research recently came out actually in the last few months, which suggested that if you gave um, people living in poverty some extra, some extra money, 
their baby's brains grow a bit differently. So I think we should use that as a template for thinking, goodness me, this isn't just about blaming parents. Otherwise, there's a real danger that we start blaming, for example, poverty on the poor and bad parenting, you know, kids' behaviour on bad parenting and that sort of thing. There's always reasons for these things, but we've got all got responsibility to try to make these things better. The public sector, whether it's social workers, teachers, youth workers, health visitors, doctors, nurses, everyone really, can have a huge, huge impact. And But in order to have an impact as a public sector worker, whether I'm a midwife, a social worker, a health visitor, I have to be able to give you some of the things that I hope you'll give your child. So I have to be present to you in this moment be genuinely interested in how you're feeling and thinking. Now, if I'm actually asking you these questions because I've got forms to fill out and I'm not really present and I've got like a thousand other people to see in, that, that in the next couple of weeks and I'm stressed myself, I'm not going to be able to give you what I need. So I think public sector workers need help. We need help. We need to help them by retraining them in the things that they really need, which is, to, which is to do with emotional understanding, empathy, compassion, being present to each other. And if I could make a plea for anything, it'll be getting rid of 90% of the form filling and the kind of um, reporting systems, which actually take away from being present and then being able to help. And then if we can educate people in early emotional development, which might be a little bit of neurodevelopmental understanding, it might be a little bit of attachment theory, it might be a little bit of how children's brains grow and develop. If we can do that as well and throw away some of the form filling and the sense of persecution that so many in the public sector feel, then we might have a much better chance of helping our children, our families and so our children. If a parent's got resources inside themselves, they can offer these capacities of what we call mind-mindedness, mentalizing. So in this concept of mind-mindedness is this ability to be in touch with the thoughts and feelings of a child. It's the best predictor we've got of secure attachment. It's, much, it's very hard to do that if you're feeling very, very stressed yourself. So some kids really need the early years envir educational environment because things aren't Things are a bit challenging at home. Some kids do better staying at home. We know that separation from a parent is always going to be stressful. We know that cortisol levels go up, for example, when you go to nursery, however securely attached, attached you are. But if the early years environments can be helped to do less of the form filling, less of the kind of what's the, obje what's the educational objective in this play and more thinking about, oh, that's so interesting, you're picking up the red pen. You know, those sorts of things, when you're really present with a child, and if parents can be helped to do those things, that can be fantastic. And I do think things like getting support with video, video interactive guidance, those kinds of things can be an absolute godsend, as long as you've got somebody who can really look at those things and help in a compassionate, kind, and non-judgmental way. <laughs>